Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you today is another video in the Anna Walsh missing persons case. We will be discussing all of the information that we know up to this point. If you did miss the first video that I made on this case, make sure you go ahead and check out that video as well as watching this one. In that video, we discussed the timeline of Anna's disappearance, information that led police to suspecting her husband, Brian, for being involved, as well as other damning evidence that were found with search warrants. We also discussed some of the past criminal history that Brian had, including being indicted on charges of selling fake Andy Warhol paintings. As a reminder though, I will go over a bit of the timeline as well as who Anna is. Anna Walsh is the 39-year-old mother of three young children, ages two, four, and six years old. She is originally from Belgrade, Serbia, with her mother and the rest of her family, as well as many friends still living in Serbia. At the time, she had dual citizenship between Serbia and the U.S. Anna was married to a man named Brian Walsh. She worked as an executive property manager at a real estate company in Washington, D.C. However, the family lives in Cohasset, Massachusetts, but she also had a property in Washington, D.C. because of how frequently she had to travel back and forth for her job. She travels pretty much weekly and really only stays with her family on the weekends. However, Anna was described as a doting, loving mother. She was a businesswoman, but she absolutely loved her family and her children. We know that Brian's past criminal history includes scamming people and selling those fake Andy Warhol paintings. We know that the man who bought these fake paintings from him said that Brian is one of the most charismatic and charming people that you could speak to. The man said that he buys these paintings for his exhibit all of the time and never once has he been fooled until he bought from Brian. After being charged in relation to this case, Anna went to the court to speak very highly of her husband. She talked about how truly of an amazing father and husband Brian truly is. She talked about how he helped her mother when she had a stroke while helping take care of his children and his own elderly mother. And according to everybody on the outside, it didn't seem like the couple had any real issues. Anna only ever spoke highly of her husband Brian and her life in the U.S., when speaking with her family in Serbia. Of note, after he was charged with selling these fake Andy Warhol paintings, he appeared in court in April of 2022, and this is when Brian was placed on house arrest as he was awaiting sentencing, where he did have to wear an ankle monitor. Now, this was a question that I had in the first video that I made on this case, but this ankle monitor did not have GPS tracking because at the time, he wasn't suspected of doing anything nefarious while being on house arrest. They really didn't think that this was some, like, hardened criminal. They didn't really think that he was going to be going out there and doing anything really horrible. So, all his ankle monitor did was it used radio frequencies that could alert authorities when he left the house, but it didn't specify where he was going. He was only allowed to travel to places that were pre-approved by the parole board, so he had to call and let them know anytime he would be traveling. The only exceptions to this were dropping his children to and from school, but other than this, he wasn't allowed to leave the house without notifying someone. However, even after writing this letter to the courts and always talking so highly of her husband, Based on the information that we now know, it seems that their relationship may not have been nearly as solid as they wanted us to think. So again, as a reminder, this case starts on New Year's Eve in 2022. Brian and Anna hosted New Year's and they had a friend over for dinner. The friend arrived at around 8.30 p.m. and left at around 1 or 1.30 a.m. on January 1st, 2023. The friend reported that throughout the night, there was no indication that either of them had any sort of issues. They talked about their goals for the new year, they seemed like they were looking forward to a lot of things, and they seemed like the solid couple that they always had been. However, that night, according to Brian, Anna had apparently told him that she had a work emergency that she had to fly back to Washington, D.C. for that next morning. So, on the next morning, or I guess the same morning, on January 1st, Anna woke up and got ready for work. 
She kissed Brian goodbye and told him to go back to sleep before she left for work that morning. Typically, when she leaves for work like this, she'll take an Uber, Lyft, or a taxi to the airport. So, according to Brian, she probably left at around 6 a.m., but he isn't exactly sure of the exact time because he did go back to sleep. After that, Brian said that he got up just after 7 and started running errands for the day. He was back and forth between the store and different places and his house with his sons from around 3 p.m. until 4 p.m. After that, the nanny came over and he said that he left the house to visit his mother who lived in Swampscott, located around an hour and five minutes away from his house. However, he said that this day in particular, it took him about an hour and a half to get there because he accidentally took the wrong highway and kind of got lost. Once he was at his mother's house, he said that he was helping his mom with chores and other things around the house until he returned back to his house in Cohasset at around 8 p.m. This trip to his mother's house was approved by his parole. During this time with his mother, he said that he stopped at a CVS and a Whole Foods to shop for her. However, after all of this, it turned out that Anna had never gotten in an Uber, taxi, or a Lyft that day. It also showed that she didn't have a plane ticket purchased for January 1st either. She didn't have a ticket to go to Washington, D.C. until January 3rd, which of course was not used. It also came out that her phone had pinged in the area of her Cahasset home on January 1st and January 2nd, when she was supposed to be in Washington, D.C. for work. She was reported missing on January 4th after a client at work realized that she had not shown up for their meeting. So I guess the client called Brian to tell him that, you know, she hadn't seen Anna, saying that she didn't show up for the meeting. But Brian also said that he hadn't seen her, so I believe they both called 911 at this point to report her as missing. Then on January 1st, the day that Anna was last seen, Brian's cell phone had either been dead or it was turned off for the entire day. This was because he said that he lost his phone that entire day and didn't find it until January 2nd. He said that, I guess, on New Year's Day, his son had hidden it under a pillow. So, because of this, as, you know, you probably have guessed by now, we don't have his cell phone pings for anywhere that he went, so a lot of his travels were found on surveillance videos. So, according to surveillance videos, it showed that not only did Brian visit his mother in Swampscott, but he also visited the towns of Brockton and Abington, which were not approved for him to travel to. They also didn't confirm any of the errands that he claimed to have been running that day when he was visiting with his mother. There was no sign that he ever went to CVS or Whole Foods based on any surveillance video. They also could not find a receipt that showed anything that he purchased. Basically, the police realized that Brian was lying about a lot of things, so they were able to get a search warrant. So, on surveillance video, police saw that Brian had been shopping at the Home Depot in Rockland at around 4 p.m., the same day that Anna went missing. This video captured him buying $450 worth of cleaning supplies, including mops, buckets, tarps, Tyvex, drop cloths, and various kinds of duct tape. In the video, he is seen wearing a black surgical mask, blue surgical gloves, and he paid for these items in cash. This trip also was not approved by his probation. Then going off of this, police were also able to get a search warrant for Brian and Anna's home, which was executed on January 8th. In the search warrant, police actually found blood in the basement as well as a damaged knife, which also had blood on it. Then the same day, police went ahead and also searched through the dumpsters outside of the apartment complex in Swampscott where Brian's mother lives. In that dumpster, police also found a hatchet, blood, a hacksaw, trash bags, used cleaning supplies, and a rug in those dumpsters. And with these bags and the blood, they did connect the DNA to Anna. By January 8th, Brian was finally charged with misleading investigators and he was being held on a $500,000 bond. At this time, he did plead not guilty to these charges. 
Also, during this time, even more came out about Brian's possible involvement in his wife's disappearance. So, as we discussed in the previous video, just before Anna's disappearance, she seemed to be in a rush to sell off any assets, including a real estate property that she owned, as well as her luxury Maserati. The people who were renting an apartment from Anna came out to say that just in the weeks before her disappearance, they knew that something about her just was not right. Now, these were tenants of hers who came out to talk about these behaviors, but they were also friends. One of the tenants had worked with Anna for the prior eight years to help manage their properties. They said that normally, Anna presented herself very calm and very professionally until one day when she acted totally out of character. They said that they were forced out of this rental property so that she could sell it. The tenant said that when they confronted Anna about this, she had a total meltdown. They said that it was just not normal for her to act in this way, and what they saw from her that day, they said was like a completely different person. They described this meltdown as a Britney Spears style meltdown. Then it was also reported that by January 6th, there had been a fire that broke out on a property that Anna and Brian had once lived in and only moved out of a few months prior, but it was a property that they still owned and they were renting out. At the time, there had been a couple, their toddler, as well as a nanny in the home who fortunately were able to escape from the house unharmed. However, I do want to say that this fire was investigated by fire experts and they deemed it an accident. They identified the cause of the fire to be a gas leak from a natural gas fireplace insert. They think that this fire being at the same time as Anna's disappearance, they think that it's just a coincidence and it doesn't have anything to do with Anna's case. Then it came out that Anna may have been preparing her home in Washington, D.C. for the boys to move there. On documents, Anna started using the Washington, D.C. address rather than her home in Cahasset, which she had used before. Then it was shown that Anna had decorated the boys' rooms at the home in Washington, D.C., even though they hadn't been there yet. So it seemed that she was preparing for a time where her boys would be with her full time. Then we know that just one week before Anna's disappearance on December 25th, she had actually reached out to her mother in Serbia, basically begging her to come over to the U.S. to visit her. Her mother is 69 years old, and again, she still lived in Serbia. In the text message, she said, please mama, come tomorrow. But she didn't necessarily tell her mother why she wanted her to come so urgently. But being that she is 69 years old, she said that she wasn't able to just drop everything and fly to the US with such short notice. She said that she takes medication and she has a thousand other things that she has to get into place before she was able to leave. So she suggested that she visit sometime in January. But to this, Anna responded that she doesn't need to come in January because her and Brian were going to be visiting them in February. Then by December 31st, so now going to the night that Anna was last seen at around midnight, Anna tried calling her mother, but her mother did not answer her call. Then she tried calling her again at around 1 a.m., but her mother also missed that call. Then Anna also tried calling her older sister, but her sister was asleep and missed the call as well. Then she tried to call one of her best friends, the woman who had been the maid of honor at her wedding, but she didn't hear her phone ring because she had been at a party which had loud music. So, because of this, none of these loved ones knew if she was reaching out for something important, and if so, why she needed to get into contact with them so urgently. Was she calling to just say Happy New Year? Or was something going on where she really needed to speak with someone? Of course, everybody close to Anna wishes that they had picked up these calls, but obviously at the time, there's no way that they could have known. There's no way that they could have controlled that they slept through these calls or didn't hear their phone go off. I definitely understanding how gut-wrenching it must feel 
and I'm sure it's difficult not to blame themselves, but these are everyday things that happen to us every day. We all miss phone calls, but most of the time, nothing happens because of it. Either way, even more shocking evidence came out about internet searches that Brian allegedly made just after his wife's disappearance. These searches were actually found on one of his children's iPads, as well as his own cell phone. I will read the searches to you now. They are as follows. By December 27th, he searches, what's the best state to divorce for a man? On January 1st, these are the following searches. At 4.55 a.m., how long before a body starts to smell? At 4.58 a.m., how to stop a body from decomposing? At 5.47 a.m., 10 ways to dispose of a dead body if you really need to. At 6.25 a.m., how long for someone to be missing to inherit? At 6.34 a.m., can you throw away body parts? At 9.29 a.m., what does formaldehyde do? At 9.34 a.m., how long does DNA last? At 9.59 a.m., can identification be made on partial remains? At 11.34 a.m., dismemberment and best ways to dispose of a body. 11.44 a.m., how to clean blood from wooden floor. 11.56 a.m., luminol to detect blood. 1.08 p.m., what happens when you put body parts in ammonia? 1.21 p.m., is it better to put crime scene clothes away or wash them? On January 2nd at 12.45 p.m., he searches hacksaw best tool to dismember. At 1.10 p.m., he searches, can you be charged with murder without a body? Then, by 1.14 p.m., he searches, can you identify a body with broken teeth? By January 3rd, the searches include, what happens to hair on a dead body at 1.02 p.m.? Then, what is the rate of decomposition of a body found in a plastic bag compared to on a surface in the woods at 1.13 p.m.? Then he appears to search, can baking soda mask or make a body smell good at 1.20 p.m. These searches, again, are allegedly made by Brian. It's not proven yet, but it doesn't seem like a two, four, or six-year-old would be making these searches on any of these devices, so it's pretty clear that it was Brian making these searches. What I'd like to do now is just describe his actions on the days from January 1st. If I need indicate on January 1st, uh, at 3 p.m. he did some errands and went to his mother's house in swamps that, but got lost um, because he didn't have his phone. He said he knew it was lost when he saw the pirate ship on Route 1. Defendant stayed, stayed 15 minutes, then went to Whole Foods and CVS. Surveillance was checked and he did not enter either of those stores. On January 4th, 1st, defendant Googled using his son's iPad some of his searches are as follows. Keep in mind that the defendant said he left at 6 a.m. At 4.55 a.m. on January 1st, he searched how long before a body starts to smell. At 4.58 a.m., how to stop a body from decomposing. At 5.20 a.m., he searched how to impound a body. At 5.47 a.m., 10 ways to dispose, dispose of a dead body if you really need to. <coughs> At 6.25 a.m. on the 1st, how long for someone to be missing to inherit? At 6.34 a.m. on the 1st, can we throw away body parts? At 9.29 a.m., what does formaldehyde do? At 9.34 a.m. on the 1st, how long does DNA last? At 9.59 a.m., can identification be made on partial remains? At 11.34 a.m., Disenmemberment and the best ways to dispose of a body. At 11.44, how to clean blood from wooden floor. At 11.56 on the first, luminol to detect blood. At 1.08, what happens when you put body parts in ammonia? At 1.21 p.m., is it better to throw crime scene clothes away or wash them? Those were on the January 1st. There was also information gained from the defendant's phone which showed on January 2nd, he was at Home uh, Goods in Norwell where he purchased three rugs. There were also more Google searches on January 2nd. At 12.45 p.m., uh, Pap saw best two to dismember. At 1.10 p.m., can you be charged with murder without a body? At 1.14 p.m., 
Can you identify a body without, with broken teeth? After all of the information about Brian's possible involvement in his wife's disappearance, neighbors had started to come out to talk about his personality and his behaviors as long as they had known him. According to neighbors, they all originally thought that Brian always seemed very happy. He seemed like a very involved husband and father. He seemed very normal. There was also someone who worked at a restaurant that he went to every week who said that he also seemed very happy and normal. But those who knew him said that after he was arrested, the smile on his face as he was being taken in and out of the police station, it just gave them the creeps. They now said that the impression that they got of Brian was completely wrong, and now they know that the person that, you know, he presented himself as is not the person that he actually is. Then, one final thing that I recently learned about this case is that back in 2014, Washington, D.C. police revealed that Anna reported that someone had made threats to kill her over the phone. Now, this person in the call is not identified as Brian Walsh or anybody else, and the case never really went anywhere, so charges were never actually filed because the accuser did not name the person responsible for making these threats, and it was said that she was not cooperating with police at this time. This is also before Brian and Anna were married. This was back in 2014, and they were married in 2015, so it was around the time that they would have known each other, but not after they were married. So we don't know for sure if this was Brian who is making these threats, but that is sort of what the news outlets are insinuating. Then finally, by January 18th, Brian Walsh was charged with murder. Based on the evidence that they have found, prosecutors believe that Brian Walsh murdered his wife, dismembered her body, and discarded her somewhere. They believe that Anna's remains were in multiple transfer stations across eastern Massachusetts. They said that it's likely that some of her remains may have been destroyed or incinerated before investigators were able to search the sites. So, that is all of the information that we know right now. Obviously, the next worry in this case is whether he will actually be able to be convicted of murder if there is no body, but we have seen it done before. We know that there's a motive. I think it's clear that just before her disappearance, Anna was preparing to leave Brian. I think it's clear that the couple were having some severe problems at home and she wanted out. I think Brian knew that he was losing control and may possibly even lose his family, so he decided to allegedly kill his wife before she was able to leave and take the children with her. But that is just my opinion, and none of this is proven fact whatsoever. It's all alleged. It's all just, again, opinion. So I guess we will find out more whenever this case goes to trial and whenever that information comes out. As of right now, just like with the Idaho 4 case, there has been a gag order placed on this case, so I don't imagine much more information is going to come out until there is a trial. But I do think that there is enough evidence, including these surveillance videos, the weapons with blood on them in the home, the fact that her DNA was connected to these items, and the very damning internet searches. I really hope that this is enough to get a conviction because I think it's very obvious what is going on here. As I say with pretty much any recent case that I cover or any case that doesn't have a resolution yet, I don't want to speculate too much on what's actually going on here and I hope that you guys do the same. I trust that most viewers of my channel are not going to go out there and put out these crazy speculations and accuse people in this case of doing things that are not confirmed. Obviously, a lot of this information points towards Brian, but after going through Anna's Instagram page, so many people were commenting on random pictures of her, like if she was posing with another guy, if she was posing with someone she worked with, saying like, oh, these two must have been cheating together, she must have been having an affair, like this has to be something that's going on, there has to be more to this, she must have been doing something on the side, she must have had someone on the side, and none of that is confirmed. None of that has been stated by anybody, including authorities or her family. So, I don't want to sit here and speculate that she must have been doing something, that she must have been having an affair. It could be as simple as she wanted out of this marriage with this horrible person, this guy who was abusive, this guy who clearly was manipulative and controlling, and that could have been 
as deep as this goes and he killed her because of that there could be more to this case but until there's more information that supports that I'm not going to be speculating on it, and I hope you guys don't either. As with the Idaho 4 case, I really hope that these cases can serve as an example that speculating too much can be very harmful, it's not helpful, and it can be really harmful to the victims and the families of the victims, as well as the investigation of this case. So again, let's just keep our speculations to a minimum and only go based off of the confirmed facts. But that is all of the information that I have on today's case. My heart goes out to Anna's mother and the rest of her family and friends that are so, so far away and just have to watch all of this unfold. They are all absolutely devastated that the man that they once trusted is now suspected of doing something horrendous. I am really looking forward to all of the information that comes out from here on out because I am pretty sure that there will be a trial. I don't think Brian's going to admit to anything or plead guilty, so I am looking forward to any more information that comes out of this and a subsequent trial. But that is where I am going to end today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. That is where I keep the most up to date with any recent case that I'm covering. So make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.